The memorial is highly contested um, and it plays a central role in ongoing struggles um, around who is the victim in the region at large. Two scholars known as Nettafield and Wagner note that wartime strategies that resulted in war crimes evolved into a post-war strategy to expunge their experiences of recent history through denial, distortion, and the revision of facts. This not only affects Severnitia's survivors, but everyone in Bosnia and Herzegovina, especially in the Republika Srpska, but also in neighboring Serbia, where, like in Republika Srpska, the genocide is still often denied. The narratives presented in the memorial cannot and do not seek to incorporate the Serbs and are clearly targeted at the Bosniaks or international visitors. This is understandable since the people killed at Potokari sites were all Bosniaks with the exception of a few Croats. The exclusion of the Bosnian Serb narratives of the war is why many local Serbs do not visit the memorial. And it is also why the Bosnian Serbs recently have established a small memorial room of their own in Srebrenica to commemorate those Bosnian Serbs who were killed in nearby villages during the war. Preserving the memory of the fall of the safe area Srebrenica and the genocide in its aftermath is not reduced to the marking of July 11th or combined to Potokari. However, to identify one particular place as a site of memory raises some critical questions concerning what is remembered and what is forgotten. If some places are remembered and present in the spatial narrative of the past, there are other places that continue to be silenced, absent, or forgotten. Other mass killings of Bosniaks and Croats have been covered by international and national media, such as the one in Brico, for example, where an estimated number of victims in Camp Luka reached 3,000, and in Omarska, Keterim and Majaka concentration camps near Prejador and the killings of Serbs in small villages such as Brutinac and Salipici. They, however, do not draw as much attention as the Severnitia commemorations. One of the motivations behind the memorial was the necessity of finding out and offering the exact sequence of events, their time and spatial frame, proving culpabilities and punishing those responsible and keeping alive memories of the crime. In this regard, the memorial fully satisfies its primary function, fighting against oblivion. Let's look at another case study, Berlin's memorial to the homosexuals persecuted under the National Socialist Regime. It was designed by Michael Elmgren Green and Ingard Dragset and inaugurated in Berlin on May 27, 2008. The German Parliament. It was built following a decision of the German Parliament in 1999 that a memorial for Holocaust victims should be established and that all other victims of national socialism should be commemorated as well. In 2003, Parliament sealed the construction of the memorial and determined its location in the Tier Garden, right in the administrative yet also commercial center of the city where it's easily accessible to tourists. Here's the history. Persecution of homosexuality began with the takeover of National Socialism in 1933, when it was branded as aberrant and all clubs, associations, and publishing houses were closed down. In 1935, this obtained its legal basis in the German Criminal Code, which condemned same-sex relations among men, leading to criminal prosecution of homosexuals. According to the plaque at the memorial site, approximately 50,000 men were sentenced and between 5 to 15,000 were deported to concentration camps where they had to wear a pink triangle called the Rosa Winkle to mark their offense and by implication, their socially unacceptable sexual orientation leading to their stigmatization among other inmates. Prior to the establishment of the memorial to the homosexuals in Berlin, there were a number of smaller initiatives since the 1960s and 70s, increasingly with reference to the Rosa Winkle. After the German federal president, Richard von Weizsäcker, publicly acknowledged in parliament in 1985 that homosexuals had also been victims of Nazi persecution, memorial sites in the former concentration camps Dachau and Sassenhausen as well as a full advent exhibition at Sachsenhausen in 2000 followed. 
Since it was inaugurated 83 years after the beginning of National Socialism, there are hardly any detainees or concentration camp survivors left to use to use it as a site for personal grievance or reflected, reflection. Due to the temporal distance, moreover, the campaigns for its establishment were not driven by survivors themselves, as is often the case with memorials, but by members of the contemporary gay community and by associations of homosexuals who were concerned about both discrimination in the past and in the present. The memorial consists of a single tall concrete block with a small square window through which the visitor can watch a film depicting the kiss of a same-sex couple. Initially, it was a 90-second film of two men kissing, running in a loop. This was replaced temporarily by a film of other same-sex couples, both male and female, kissing interchangeably. The concealed screening of the same-sex scene, kissing scenes rendered them visible and invisible at the same time. They are hidden from view from being inside the block but they are nonetheless there. As to its meaning, this oscillation between presence and absence continues until today, as one of the artists states, quote, today we accept homosexuals, but we don't want to see them. The memorial thus draws past injustices into the present and serves as a symbol against current and future stigmatization of homosexuals. The plaque next to the memorial offers a historical account of the persecution of homosexuals under National Socialism, both in German and in English, and declares that it serves as a lasting symbol against exclusion, intolerance, and animosity towards gays and lesbians. Though using blocks, the aesthetic language of the memorial connects to Eisenman's memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe, comprised of 2,711 blocks, just on the other side of the street establishing a bond between various victim groups of National Socialism and undermining discussions about competitive victimhood. According to one of the artists, quote, it was the same suffering, the same history, but at the same time, there were many differences. The repeated use of the blocks also draw attention to the obliteration of the plight of homosexuals in the decades following National Socialism compared to other victim groups who were able to stand up for their rights, as well as to the ignorance or discrimination that they currently endure. Reestablishing the dignity of victims was the key impetus behind the memorial to the homosexuals persecuted, persecuted under the National Socialist regime. This was important regarding the period of National Socialism, but also because persecution did not end with its demise in 1945. In fact, there was continued persecution. In West Germany, the code was applied until 1969 and only completely lifted in 1994, and it took until 2002 to, legalize, to legally rehabilitate men who had been sentenced on this basis. Keeping the law after the end of National Socialism was unusual, since the Allies did not otherwise allow the retaining of laws which had increased in severity under the Nazis. Some homosexuals even had to continue serving their sentences set under the regime. Moreover, between 1950 and 1969, over 100,000 legal investigations were opened and 59,000 men were sentenced for being homosexual. As a consequence, in the first decades after National Socialism, there was a culture of silence around the persecution and prosecution of homosexuals. The continuing criminalization and stigmatization kept victims from coming forward to tell their stories or even to demand reparations. Lack of compensation. While Jews, Sinti, and Roma were labeled victims under the Nuremberg laws and were eligible for compensation, and other victims of fascism had access to some form of monetary and social rehabilitation, homosexuals, asocials, criminals, Victims of euthanasia and forced sterilization and displaced persons had no right to claim reparations. To finally gain some public recognition through the memorial was thus a major achievement. And in this sense, the memorial serves as a belated sign of resistance in a former culture of impunity. In terms of public debate, a further achievement of the memorial is to encourage public debates about past injustices. Against the backdrop of silence in the years following National Socialism, it helps to draw their plight into the public realm. But there is contention as well. 
The main contention about the memorial was not and is not about its existence per se, but about who it's for. In its initial conception, the memorial was for gay men only since they were signaled, singled out by the code. And there is very little record and ev evidence of lesbians being targeted during national socialism and the ensuing decades. But from a feminist perspective, it was argued that women too were affected by the Nazi regime, even though they were less frequently sentenced and arrested, and that women as well as men continue to suffer from homophobia today, again, linking past and present. The conceptual opening up of the memorial to both sexes led to heated debates and historical accuracy on the one hand, and the perpetual exclusion and invisibility of homosexual women in society on the other. There are other types of memorialization to consider as well, and one of them is counter memorials. The memory scape of transitional societies often also includes counter memorials as um, we will discuss. In parallel to official memorialization, memorial groups and individuals who feel excluded, silenced, or forgotten initiate non-official alternative grassroots ways of representing the past. Such counter memorials do not represent, represent the quote, right memory, but can become a collective social symbol with the ability to encapsulate and perpetuate certain identities and claims may be established in resistance towards a uniform and exclusive memorialization process. Counter memorials are important as they reveal the danger of uniform interpretations of the past and encourage multiple understandings of the past. Furthermore, by communicating narratives of the past to the public, memorials also introduce a new type of agent to the field of transitional justice in addition to victims and perpetrators, the visitor, and in doing so, displace the dichotomy, dichotomy of victims and perpetrator by not belonging to either group. One example is Daniel Lipskind's Jewish Museum in Berlin, in which he designed a museum with six voids built into the architecture to remind everybody who enters that no matter what they see of Jewish history, it is going to be disrupted, interrupted by the memory of the Holocaust. Another famous example is Maya Lin's Vietnam Veterans Memorial, which is a place where Vietnam veterans come to remember their fallen comrades and where Americans can begin to remember how they received the veterans when they came back from Vietnam. It reflects America's loss, the divided American society, and the memorial reflects this ambivalence. Also, you can see on the screen, um, in Hungary, um, Hungary erected um, the Archangel Gabriel um, as being attacked by the German Imperial Eagle um, as a way of absolving it from its active role of sending 450,000 Jews to their deaths. Uh, so it was erected and you can see the counter memorial in front of it where people have placed their own memorials to remind Hungary of the um, role that they played in the um, Holocaust as well. The lack of recognition of women. Commemorative landscapes, particularly those which evoke the memory of war, are clearly gendered, as we have talked about in class, as they produce and reproduce the experiences and narratives of men and often silence women's interpretations of the war. We talked about this in the last two classes in terms of gender and DDR programs and the fact that women are not honored for what they did, nor are they recognized as soldiers. Feminist scholars have raised the question, what role do commemorations and memorials play in dispelling or affirming the gender order in post-conflict contexts? In transitional societies and in war-torn societies, male war heroes or war veterans are frequently commemorated, but the varied experiences of women often remain excluded or silenced in the construction of these narratives of the past that is represented in memorials. Thus, there's an urgent need to discuss the gendered nuances of commemorations in transitional societies through a critical examination of commemorative material culture, uh, such as monuments and memorials. Post-memory is another critical yet underexploited aspect of the connection between memorialization, memory, and transitional justice. By handing down through the generations a version of events that reproduces identity and anchors memory in the site of the most intense experiences, memorials are key to transferring memory across generations and to intergenerational commemoration and remembering. 
Memorials such as the one in Srebrenica Potokari risk fetishizing the place as its name will forever be associated with genocide and obscure a wider social memory capable of accommodating different recollections and interpretations. Clearly, memorials derive their importance from the ideas and values that are projected through them. These ideas and values are not fixed in time and can be dissonant, and they can, be, they can reject official historical narratives to present an alternative reading of place and memory. And due to their construction and representation of a particular past, they acquire certain functions and thus lend themselves to affecting societies in transition as central to the idea of transitional justice, yet both with positive and negative repercussions. The second part of your assignment for this evening is to actually go and look for memorials um, for a conflict in the world, um, something that we haven't discussed yet in this lecture for tonight. I would like you to write a paragraph about the memorial, um, looking at um, why it was erected and uh, whether or not it's contested or um, basically what the memorial is and who is it honoring and what the implications of the memorial are. Okay, so since I won't see you this week or over Thanksgiving, I need to talk to you a little bit about the research paper which is due on November 29th, right before class starts. I'm going to post an example research paper in the announcement section, so I want you to look at it to see the requirements. A couple of weeks ago, I also gave you the research paper checklist. So when you turn in your research paper, at the very end, I want you to copy and paste the research paper checklist. I want you to check off all that you did and type your name in as the signature. Here's a link to the checklist using Google Docs. Then during the exam week, you will give a five minute presentation on your research, which we'll talk about more at length the next time I see you on November 29th, but you'll have to start preparing for it ahead of time. We will go over the research paper presentations on November 29th, but let me give you an idea of what you need to do. You will be given a five minute presentation on your research paper during the exam week. We are scheduled for our final exam um, on Thursday, December 13th in our normal spot, Armstrong 136 from two to 450. And you can do two things for your presentation. We talked about this a little bit before. You can stand in front of the class and present like we've been normally doing, which is fine. Or if you wanna get it over with, you can create a screencast or a video and upload it to youtube.com. You just have to be careful. It may be a better idea to use your own private Google account and not the school's account to upload the video because of the school's privacy settings, okay? So then after you upload it, you wanna open a new incognito window by going to the three lines or the three dots in the top right corner, making sure that you're logged out of Google and then paste the link and see if you can view it, okay? The video should not be any longer than five minutes. Okay. You may not include any videos in your presentation since there's little time pre to present. Okay. And finally, I have put here the research paper presentation checklist. Look through it. This is what we're looking for or I'm looking for when you're presenting. Uh, so make sure that you have these. I will also post them on the announcement section because it looks like it's cut off a couple of things that I had at the bottom. So when you're practicing your presentation, make sure you have all these things. This came out of our discussions during class time about what was a strength and what were the weaknesses um, when it comes to um, presenting. For our final class before the presentations, which will take place on November 29th, our final class. Okay, you're going to look at the questions that you see above, and you're going to look at these four um, resources. They're not hard. You can see that there are a New York Times article, Atlantic, the Atlantic article, NPR, and then I would like you to go to 
the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, which is what we have in our country, and look at the video called Why Build a Lynching Museum, and also click on the link here about um, part six. I want you looking at part six, trauma and the legacy of lynching. We're gonna talk about it at length next week, okay? So you have two questions that you have to take care of um, for tonight. You need to turn it in before midnight. If you have any questions, you can email me up to nine o'clock. Then I have to go to bed because we start at 6.55 in the morning. Thank you for listening to me. Sorry if you heard like thunder in the background. That's the dogs and the cats running around, chasing each other, having fun. So sorry about that. And I hope you have a happy Thanksgiving. And I look forward to seeing you on November 29th.